employers need highly qualified and diverse talent to grow. Unmuddle is a marketplace to help you with workforce and upskill needs. To learn more, go to unmuddle.com slash employers. That's U-N-M-U-D-L dot com slash employers. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the Ed Up Experience podcast, where we make education your business. Dr. Joe Salustio here with you again. Episode 400 and something has been released. It's our 150th college and university president that we just put out. Happened to be Dr. Michael Crow from Arizona State University, one of the one of the industry's trailblazers. Um, as, as many of you know, I've mentioned on my podcast, I am moving from Southern California to St. Louis for my job at Lindenwood University as the Senior Vice President for Enrollment Management in Lindenwood Global. I know it's a mouthful, uh, but uh, that is the title I've been given. And uh, I have six U boxes sitting in my driveway uh, in between podcasting, in between doing my regular job, I go down and I move a box. I come back in a dead sweat because it's like 99 degrees outside. Uh, such is the life of a podcaster and uh, employee within higher education today. One person who is not an employee right now on a sabbatical, if you will, is my guest co-host today. You've heard her before. In fact, you've heard her many times here on the Edup Experience. She was a guest. Then she came back and said, Joe, your podcast stinks. I think I need to come co-host with you. I was like, all right. And so she came in to co-host with me. And then she came back again and again because she said that my uh, skills needed improvement. Um, and here she is, ladies and gentlemen. Her name is Lisa Honaker. Lisa, welcome back. Thank you, Joe. It is great to be back with you. And the last time we were together, indeed, I was employed. You were, but now you're on a sabbatical. What does that mean exactly, sabbatical, in this day and age? Yes, yeah, so I think that it is a timely question given our guest and what our guest's organization, part of their mission is. So I think that this is quite serendipitous, but the difference between a sabbatical and a vacation um, from the research that I've done is a vacation is very much about recreation and a sabbatical is very much about personal and professional improvement. So um, that exactly, Joe. Well done. Um, so uh, as many of your guests know, I'm very passionate about a growth mindset and constantly developing myself and others. And I have spent the last 29 years relentlessly giving back to others. So I'm taking a few weeks here to personally develop myself for the next chapter in my life. Well, I'm proud of you. I got to be honest. I mean, that's a huge move after being somewhere for 29 years and, um, and then moving on to new opportunity. I think that's, uh, that's great. And an example of the landscape these days, I think we're all trying to follow our passions in the most serious of ways, Lisa. And if there's one thing I know about you, it's that you're passionate. Wouldn't you agree? I would agree, Joe. You know, one thing I do know about when you and I get together, Lisa. Hold on tight. This is going to be a bumpy ride. I think our guest left already. I'm not sure if he's still here. I'm going to have to check on him. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't know him, then you don't know what's happening around you. His name is Greg Brown, and he's president of Udemy. Oh, uh, 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 yeah. What's up, Greg? Hey, good to be with you. Um, if, if people want to know, um, you just heard me intro, Greg. I actually made a huge mistake uh, before as I was giving him an applause, and I felt that was not good enough, so I had to come back and give him this one. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. You won't hear the applause, but I thought it was timely. Greg, speaking of timely... We are so honored to have you here on the podcast. Um, you're doing some incredible work at Udemy, growing like gangbusters. And um, let's just assume um, for a minute that somebody is listening to this podcast, even though they're probably in higher education somewhere and hasn't heard of Udemy. Just level set for us. What do you guys do and how do you do it? Yeah, I think in, in the most... You know, basic terms, we're a leading destination for learning and teaching online. And, you know, true to our mission, you know, we provide flexible, effective skill development uh, to empower both organizations and individuals around the globe. And what makes us unique is, is our marketplace model. And it, 
It really is the ultimate creator platform for skills development. We were founded, I don't know, 13 years ago now by some brilliant folks uh, out of uh, you know Eastern Europe and Turkey, and they came up with this idea that you know there should be a way for anybody that has skills and capability anywhere on the four corners of the earth to be able to package that information inside up and uh, become a teacher, if you will, and deliver that to anybody and, and you know in you know, any place around the globe that would want to consume that content to learn and grow and develop themselves. And, and uh, you know, I started, you know, like I said, 13 years ago. And, you know, here we are today. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, Udemy Business, the business unit that I oversee here, uh, north of 280 million in revenue, growing 80% a year. So, you know, we really are affecting lives around the world. And, and that uh, is, is what we're here to do. And we're really proud of it. All right. So talk about what um, let's get to the meat and the bones. What did coronavirus do to your organization? And, and let's get by the CV question because it's always in there somewhere. But talk about pre-COVID, now post-COVID almost, and uh, how you to me flexed and grew during that time. Yeah, look, it, it was an accelerant. As you can imagine with uh, individuals as well as individuals within organizations being you know sequestered and, and locked in homes and and not being able to live life as, as we you know, normally did, uh, folks were going online to looking for digital platforms as ways to, to learn and grow and develop. And, and within organizations, organizations looking for ways to continue to upskill and reskill their employees uh, for a better part of a two year period that was unlike anything any of us had ever uh, lived through. So, you know, without question, an accelerant both on the consumer side of our business as well as on the B2B side of our business. And, you know, the way that we looked at it is it was one of those rare opportunities where we really could uh, impact lives and help folks uh, in ways by which, uh, you know, we, we would not have, have even thought of, you know, prior to going through a global pandemic. So, you know, again, we're very, very proud of our ability to, you know, to help folks through a very difficult time, help organizations through a very difficult time. And the U2B business side of our, uh, of our business was accelerating and growing rapidly going into COVID. Uh, and in coming out of COVID, you know, we continue to grow at, at an accelerated pace. And, uh, and I really, I think, is a result of a digital transformation that's going on within organizations right now. And organizations now are trying to figure out how to, you know, survive and thrive uh, in a hybrid world where Facebook and a lot of organizations have come out and said, you know, we're never going to require employees to go back full time into an office. Uh, and most organizations are still trying to, you know, find their way through at the decision process around how they're going to manage the work-life balance going forward. But that being said, uh, you know, very fortunate uh, to be able to, you know, again, uh, you know, be of service and, and to be able to help organizations through this difficult time. You know, um, before I pass it to you, Lisa, I do want to ask, you know, one of the, one of the, I don't know, I, it's a phenomenon is this whole um, higher ed doesn't have value anymore. Or the value of a higher education degree may not be as valuable as it was before. People need skills. They need them now. They want to stack them. They want to, I don't know, choose your own adventure as it will, instead of maybe having something that's prescribed, or maybe they just need a, a skill and not this whole stack of skills. And so that it's going to enhance their, their ability to get a job or keep a job or advance through a job. And in the past, higher ed used to be the provider of that, um, yeah. albeit in a slower paced way. Um, as we like to say in higher ed, we are not the fastest moving industry in the entire universe. Um, maybe not even anybody's top 20, but we're, we're, we're trying. And then you to me, other like kind of fast moving startups come in and they say, hey, we can do this. We can provide these skills. We could maybe even partner with higher ed in certain ways or not, but we'll be this main provider to businesses because we move faster. We can customize faster. Do, are you competing with higher ed institutions, as it were, for the B2B part of the business? Or, or is it you're just so much faster providing those skills, the businesses are just dying for talent, and so they're looking for something fast? Look, I, there, without question, there's still a place for higher education, and that's not going to change anytime soon. I can assure you, <laughs> I'm sending my kids to higher, you know, higher, higher ed institution uh, as they graduate high school and move on to college, and that's happening soon. And, you know, we're not hearing at all from organizations that they're not, uh, you know, interested in, uh, you know, employees that, uh, you know, have higher ed or, or, they're, they're, or that they're not prioritizing that. Without question, higher education has a place in the broad education uh, category. But, you know, as recent as February, look, Harvard, came, uh, Harvard Business Review came out with a study just to illustrate the point. 
uh, that analyz analyzing 50 million recent job announcements uh, to see what skills and degrees were in demand. And what they found is the Great Recession really has dramatically accelerated the trends organizations are seeing moving away from degree requirements towards skills-based hiring. But it's not either or, it's both, right? And so, you know, we recently acquired a company called Corp U and on the leadership development side, and their core content, uh, you know, pr approach, if you will, is, is partnering with higher education, uh, you know, institutions and instructors and what have you to bring that leadership development content in uh, and package it and deliver it in ways that provide, you know, on a digital uh, platform, a social learning capability, right, or a cohort-based learning capability. And we're, you know, we're really excited about, you know, what we're seeing, you know, out of that investment and that, uh, and that acquisition really is starting, to, you know, to, to be fruitful for us because for us, it gives us, you know, a, a new dimension, if you will, uh, or modality, learning modality to layer into the asynchronous content that we've historically had on our marketplace. Yeah. Again, it's not one or the other, it's both. And I think what we're hearing from organizations is they want optionality and they want, uh, you know, a, new modalities and new ways of thinking and delivering learning uh, in this fast paced, ever changing world that, they're, that their learners, which are their employees, you know, are, uh, you know, adapting to as they're working from home now more than ever. Uh, and, you know, what they're trying to deliver on a global basis in terms of, you know, the, the upscaling and rescaling that, uh, that they believe they need to be able to, to deliver. So it's not either or, it's both. Uh, you know, we're very passionate about the relationships we have via Corp U through higher ed, and we're going to continue to foster those, right? We're not moving away from that at all. Now, Lisa, what do you think of this? Are you having a good time today? This is so fun. Well, I'm glad you said so, Lisa. Go ahead. Okay, Joe, you know I love this. This is so fun. Lord have mercy. I drank this up and you know it. Um, Greg, if we could go back to one of the comments that you made right out of the gate and uh, the shift to remote work and where organizations are really balancing that now. Um, very similar to any other polarizing topic. And Lord knows uh, in today's day and age, all you have to do is open Yahoo News and anything is polarizing. Um, nice. Exactly. Uh, but remote work is very much so. Uh, many employees moved away from the corporate office uh, during the last two years. And now corporate offices are like, hey, you got to move back or else we're going to find somebody else for your job. And so you've got these two very distinct camps of employees that have said, hey, I made it work over the last two years, nothing changed. And you've got employers saying, yeah, but we only collaborate when we're together and we need to collaborate over the water cooler and whatnot. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you see Udemy being able to bridge this polarization of remote work. Yeah, it's a really good question. Yeah, I spent a lot of time, you know, with CLOs of our, of our you know, larger enterprise customers talking about strategy and invariably this topic comes up uh, in, in most of the conversations. And I think what they're wrestling with and what we're partnering with them on is, is to really you know, develop a balanced approach that's going to allow their employees the flexibility to, you know, optimize their productivity and, and considering work-life balance and, and, but still give them all the tools and, and, and resources they need to continue to grow and develop and, and upskill themselves, uh, you know, and, and in many cases, uh, as, as you mentioned, in, you know, in a situation or a world where they're not in offices and, you know, I think for us, you know, we're doing a lot around, you know, you know kind of tailored learning paths and, and looking at the, the, the different types of content and, and the way that organizations are focusing on allowing their employees to consume that content uh, and still get the validation they need, right? They need, I mean, whether it be a certification or a badge or, you know, some sort of validation that the, the employees have acquired the necessary skills for them to be able to either you prepare for the next promotion or apply them to the next strategic initiative or what have you, you know, well, well. still have that need. Uh, and employees want that validation. So to be able to, you know, either put that on the LinkedIn profile or to be able to, you know, demonstrate that, you know, that they have got those skills, but not necessarily, uh, you know, doing it in the way we all did it, you know, prior to the, you know, to the pandemic. So, you know, I think that's, that really is what we're very focused uh, on and partnering with our customers and, 
Uh, and there's, and that's an ongoing process. We don't have it all figured out. And by the way, everybody is thinking about it slightly differently, as you could imagine. Oh, no doubt. And Joe, I'm going to kick it back over to you here in a second. Um, but I'm going to uh, give a few highlights uh, from an article that I read in the Wall Street Business Journal, um, actually written by Greg. And just a few points that stood out. And for our podcast listeners out there, um, in our pregame show, I shared with Greg that I'm a big consumer of all the content that comes out from Udemy, all the research that they do. But here are some very interesting things that speak to exactly what Greg just said. Attention. Exactly. Thank you. I'm just getting you ready. Joe. I feel like we got to build you up. Thank you for clearing the runway for me. I really appreciate it. You're like the best partner I've ever had. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So when organizations invest in a learning culture, um, which ironically is typically the first thing that gets cut when companies go through any sort of trouble. And many companies, in fact, did go through said trouble over the last two years. Um, but here's where investing in learning and development pays off big time. 2.6 times more likely to exceed financial targets, three times more likely to delight customers, and 4.1 times more likely to adapt well to change. I think that that speaks volumes as to the one functional area that organizations tend to walk away from in times of trouble is actually the one that they should double down on um, because it can truly help accelerate that turnaround. And we haven't talked about retention yet, but I'll be excited to dive into that after I give you a turn, Joe. Well, Greg, how, what do you say to all those, those points? Do you think people realize it? Do you think companies realize that they should be doubling down on learning development in times that are tough or is it a convincing process? I think now more than ever. I, I, I tell you, I'll, I'll give you one example or one anecdote as to, to why I feel that way. I was on a phone with one of the, a CEO of a large, uh, you know, multinational organization, which I'll leave nameless for, <laughs> for the sake of this conversation. And he, he literally told me, he said, Greg, I'm just scared to death that my employees are sit in front of the laptops playing games all day, and I don't know what to do about it. And you know, obviously I snickered a little bit and said, you know, look, we're, everybody's in the same boat from the standpoint of really just trying to figure out how to rationalize this environment and, and this, the hand we've been dealt, yeah, and how to, how to think about it going forward. But in the same breath, you know, you mentioned, you know, but the one thing I know is we have to continue to invest in developing our talent and giving them the ability to grow. Otherwise, they're going to go somewhere else to do that. And so we've got to figure out ways to do that. And we want to partner with you. I and mean, this was a, you know, a customer we worked with for some time. We want to partner with you guys to innovate and figure out how to do it in this new world that, that, that we're operating in. And so, you know, we went on with the conversation, but, you know, invariably, yes, organizations, I think now more than ever, and especially going into a recession, look, we're, we're in one as far as I'm concerned, but, you know, you know, in, in retrospect, we'll figure out exactly when the date was, but, uh, you know, in this environment that we're now operating and it's, I think it's going to get a little bit worse before it gets better organizations are going to start tightening the bootstraps. You're already hearing about it. You know, Apple not hiring engineering and other organizations really slowing down hiring or stopping hiring. Um, I think now more than ever, yeah, having, having gone through a few of these, uh, you know, hence the gray hair, but those of us that have been leading organizations, you know, you do realize that now is almost the time you have to double down because you, the last thing in the world you want to do is lose your A player talent, the best talent that you've got, uh, that helps you get to where you're at that's going to sustain the organization through this tough time and so yeah you know we really are seeing continued investments right now and we expect to see continued investments and you know, as we go through the recession and um you know i, I really think we're going to run counter cyclical i think the whole category is going to run somewhat counter cyclical to you know to the recession that we're dealing with you know for those reasons i think it really has been you look at all the surveys as well ceos you know the, the most recent one i think i saw was last year top three priorities you know, in talent development is up there and still up there. So I think that's changed over the last 10 years. I've been in HR tech for some time now, a little over 10 years at different companies. And it wasn't the case, you know, 10, 15 years ago uh, in terms of the priority around investing and developing talent in your people. But I do believe it is today. The vision of Unmuddle for the future 
is that the high cost, rigidity, and uncertain reward of pursuing higher education would be replaced with an economical, transparent, infinitely adjustable sequence of lifelong learning stints in which the employer, college, and learner are in constant communication about current needs and the system can respond quickly to each. Employers need highly qualified and diverse talent to grow. Unmuddle is a marketplace that will help you with workforce and upskilling needs. To learn more, go to unmuddle.com slash employers. Well, I want to have you ask about retention, Lisa, but before you do, I think you know what time it is. It's time for another episode of Higher Ed Word Association. This is where we get to give you a phrase, Greg, or, and Lisa, you get to play too. I'm sure you're loving it. Where I give you a phrase or a set of words in higher education or education-based, and you're going to tell me the first group of thoughts, and feel free to elaborate uh, the thoughts that come to your mind. Otherwise, if you give me a one-word answer back, it makes for a very short game, which nobody likes here at the Edip Experience. And Lisa, you're going to go first so that we can best prepare our guest, uh, Greg, for for what's coming his way. Are you ready, Lisa? I sure am. Okay, so I'm going to give you the easy one. Soft skills. Am I supposed to give a list of them? You're supposed to take it in whatever direction you want. That's why it's hired word association, so I don't have to tell you what to do. You just go. Okay. So soft skills are those skills that are very difficult to train and yet the ones most coveted by employers. Uh, A few of them, uh, but not an exhaustive list, are listening, empathy, relating, critical thinking to a degree, um, visioning. Those are a few. Joseph. Is sabbatical on that list. What? What? Okay, sorry. I just had Negative. To. <laughs> Craig, uh, soft skills. I'll add to that. Yeah. You know, I think the new term is power skills because I, I, I couldn't agree more. They said that's really what they are. Uh, they're the most covered uh, skills, uh, you know, within organizations. And, and I think she nailed them. You know, it's, uh, you know, communication capability. It's, uh, critical thinking and you know it's, it's those types of skills that you know those EQ skills uh, and capabilities that you know that we all know really uh, you know influence the direction of organizations teams and and, and ultimately it's the success of companies so uh, you know that's how I think about it and I think now more than ever we're seeing you know our uh, customers asking more of us in those areas for those reasons it's one of the reasons why we bought core view you know, management, leadership, exec development. Well, I mean, that's, you know, on the soft skills side, but organizations are, they realize that, you know, they've got, number one, they've got to evolve from doing all that stuff face-to-face, which is the way we all used to do it, right? Flying instructors in or flying on site, going off site to a location and doing that heavy on site for, uh, you know, face-to-face in-person stuff. Uh, but those skills are so darn critical for organizational effectiveness and, and performance. And, and they are the hardest skills uh, to, you know, to, to uncover, to develop and train uh, for. And, and there's a big investment we're seeing across the board, across verticals uh, and organizations looking for help uh, to develop those, those power skills that are so coveted. Yeah, you know, I've been giving this one out to a lot of folks and you get power skills or critical business skills. And I mean, they just can't be understated or overstated how important it is for us to properly name soft skills because they are everything but soft. Uh, in this day and age, right? It's the, it's critical life skills is what one of my previous guests, uh, guests said. All right, Greg, you're up next. Here we go. Um, professional development. Um, I misunderstood the first word that comes to mind in terms of, you know, uh, you know, what professional development historically has been, I think, you know, whether it be related to performance uh, development, professional development, but, uh, you know, the, again, I, I look at this through the eyes of customers right now when I think about professional development and it's a big area of investment, you know, right now and in, in developing that growth mindset, you know, within, within their employee base uh, and really, you know, trying to get creative and come up with ways to incent employees to really invest the time and energy, again, in this hybrid world uh, and, and, and taking the, 
the steps to develop themselves professionally. And it's not just technical skills, it's holistically. And really putting a plan together, and, and that's one of the other areas we're helping a lot of organizations, is, is, is helping them construct with the technology stack that they've got, uh, the ability to leverage our content uh, into their LXPs and LMSs and you know, all the you know, technology they use to run their, uh, you know, the, the learning and development programs to develop really uh, tailored professional development paths for different types of groups of individuals so that they have a guided journey. Uh, that it's not just on them to figure it out, but they're giving them optionality based off the direction they'd like to go in their career to develop themselves professionally uh, and, and, and with the end result for organizations to be able to retain talent for longer and to increase the percentage of roles they get filled from internal promotion or internal uh, constituents that can move laterally or uh, you know, in direct line, but up uh, through the process of, of professional skills development. So, you know, it's a big area of focus right now for, for us as a result of uh, the, the area of, excuse me, the amount of focus that our customers have on it. That's a tough act to follow, Lisa. Professional development. It is a tough act to follow, but I'm unbelievably passionate about it. So I'm going to give it. I know you are. The old college try here. And that one is for you, Joe. Um, what comes to mind is the author, Marshall Goldsmith. And what got you here won't get you there. And if people are not constantly professionally developing themselves, they are Level becoming, up. exactly, they are becoming very quickly irrelevant. And what we learned through COVID and even leading up to COVID is the half-life of skills continues to accelerate and certain skills that people have held on to forever and believed to their core fiber would never be replaced with technology. Guess what? Being replaced with technology. Even in the discipline that I work in, in sales, you know, you think when somebody says, oh, you work in sales, what do you, you think? The, all the crazy movies about people in sales. Um, but uh, many of those functions you think, well, sales is a relationship and relationships can't be replaced with AI or any sort of technology. Well, the reality is that it can. Um, not the entirety of the sales motion unto itself, but many components within the sales motion can be and is being replaced by technology. And so from a sales perspective, if you are not constantly be staying relevant and understanding um, what needs to be done to meet a customer where they are in their buyer's journey, then you quickly become irrelevant. Wow. Well said. I will say this, and I think you would both agree, we're all in sales, aren't we? If you're, Absolutely. If you aren't if you don't consider yourself to be in sales, then, then I don't know. I think that's a mistake. We're all selling something at some point or affecting a customer journey at some way at some point. And the sooner we all realize that, the better our customer journeys will be. Um, and uh, that's my nugget for today. All right, Greg, here we go. Your last one, non-traditional student. Non-traditional student. What do you think? I think what comes to mind, I guess, is um, I think it's just the evolution that we're seeing right now from, you know, my generation in my 50s. You know, it was a foregone conclusion that, you know, I was, you know, going to a tradition the university and uh, traditional path and, and so on and so forth. It wasn't even a second thought to, you know, alternative ways of educating myself and developing my professional skills, personal skills, and what have you. I think today, as we mentioned earlier, the traditional degree is not going anywhere, uh, and for good reason. But the ability for folks to augment their professional development, personal development, and so on and so forth with platforms you know, like Udemy or others uh, to develop themselves in a broader set sense than just going through the traditional track. And, and what I mean by that is this, you know, if I'm going through, and I, I was a business major, so marketing major, so I'm going through marketing, you know, my, my marketing track and it's a four-year track and so on and so forth. 
During that period of time, I may want to develop a specific set of capabilities and skills in performance marketing because that you know that's something that's very interesting to me, and it's an area that I want to. I really want to explore before I before I graduate to determine whether or not I even really want to go into performance marketing. I think I do. Well, guess what? You can go to a platform like Udemy and take two or three performance marketing courses from the leading experts in the world because we've got folks from all over the world on our platform delivering this type of uh, you know education experience uh, content that's relevant to a specific set of skills. And I can, number one, acquire those skills, become very competent and capable, but also determine whether or not that's, a, you know, that's the path I want to take in my career, in my life. And, and that's just one example of, you know, alternative measures or, you know, maybe a, a, a non-traditional, uh, you know, approach to, you know, educating oneself. And you know, I think it's great. I mean, I think, and there's a lot of other platforms out there as well, obviously beyond Udemy. And, um, you know, we think ours is unique, again, because of the marketplace capability we have and the freshness of our content and all the, the stuff that makes us a bit unique. But, you know, I think, you know, the more avenues folks have uh, to be able to, regardless of where they live or what their, you know, what their circumstances are, uh, you know, the economic means and what have you, because not everybody has economic means to go to a traditional university. But now with the digital platforms that are out there, you can learn uh, the skills that you need to learn to be able to apply yourself and develop a career and develop, you know, a, a capability that's going to be fruitful for both you and, and you know, the organizations you're working for. So I think the options now are, are greater than ever for the non-traditional approach. 100%. Love it. Lisa, non-traditional student. In one word, I would say me. Um, I have an undergrad degree in finance. I have a MBA in organizational development. And I constantly am going back to executive development programs through um, formal institutions or pursuing online learning through organizations just like Udemy. I, you know, just like I said earlier, I want to stay relevant. I lead sales organizations. So by default, I have to stay relevant to be able to be connected to them and bring value to them as well as the customer base that I serve. So to me, um, non-traditional student is most certainly yours truly. It's interesting. And I, I, this comes up a lot and I give non-traditional student, uh, by the way, let me sidebar. Everybody asks me, what does it take to be a great podcast host? And I say, do a word association. You don't even have to do anything. And people just crush <laughs> it on these episodes. You just say, word and they go crazy um so you'd really a podcast hosting i'm showing how you could be relevant as a podcast host but uh but i do enjoy it so don't uh, don't turn off your ears and please listen to the edup experience anyway i ask about non-traditional uh, learners a lot and what one of our previous guests said why does it have to have this negative to it almost like well you're traditional that sounds so good and when you're non-traditional it's like well you weren't quite traditional and so she said working learner is what they've, uh, somebody coined working learner, and that is what we all are, working learners. When you're an yeah. adult, you never stop, right? And you're working and you're taking care of family and you're trying to advance in your job, but it doesn't mean you stop learning and you don't have to be non-traditional. You, you can be a traditional working learner. Um, traditional and non-traditional was the path and the program, the, how you took the program, not a descriptor of the student necessarily. Anyway. Um, I'm going to have to go to the judges here because I felt like this is a really close, close episode. I'm going to have to, to ask the judges first, um, did Lisa Honaker win this episode? False. I'm sorry, Lisa. Of, of course, you know that no guest host could ever win Higher Ed Word Association. So the win always goes to the guest and that is your guest today, Greg Brown, president of Udemy. All right, Lisa, over to you to talk about retention. And of course he would win. I it totally. It happens really fast, right? Like you're in the game and then you're out of the game and you don't even know what happened. And then the episode continues. You're literally kicked to the curb. Okay. Um, so talking about the great resignation, uh, your organization kind of addresses both sides of the coin. So whether you are the organization looking to retain your top talent, uh, in comes you to me, or if you have uh, those employees that are looking to pursue their next great passion, just like Joe opened up our conversation today, 
in comes Udemy. So talk to us a little bit about how your organization approaches both segments, oftentimes within the exact same organization. Yeah, you know, we spend, so as we talked about in the onset, you know, I lead the, the B2B uh, division within Udemy and, you know, we spend all of our time helping organizations uh, you know, prepare their employees, you know, be it upskilling, reskilling for, for the next opportunity, uh, be it, you know, again, a strategic comparison initiative or direction they're taking the company where they need a, 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 a upskilling and reskilling of a cohort of folks or uh, whether it's, you know, tailored learning paths that uh, we're helping them co-develop for their employees so they can continue to learn and grow in the current role or explore new, new avenues or what have you. So we spend a lot of time, I mean, that really is the business we're in. Uh, and all of it has to do with, you know, organizations wanting to make sure that uh, they're developing the capability for their learners to grow and develop so that they retain those, those individuals and they learn and grow and develop within their organization. They don't go somewhere else to do that. And so, uh, yeah, we're at the heart of, you know, their uh, you know, talent development strategies without question. And that's, you know, that's where we spend the majority of our time. On the individual side, you know, we've got a whole consumer side of our business to where individuals, you know, go and uh, explore, you know, a myriad of, uh, of topics, both, you know, on the professional side, as well as if you want to learn how to play the guitar or, you know, uh, uh, you know, big, you know, new kind of bread or whatever it happens to be. So there, there's a lot of optionality on the consumer side. Uh, you know, to, to dive in and, you know, learn, grow up, skill, reskill. And, you know, we, you know, you know, we foster that uh, equally uh, and as passionately on both the consumer side of our business as well as on the, you know, the UB side. So, uh, you know, we're very agnostic in that, uh, you know, in that area. And, uh, you know, again, we're very fortunate that we've got, you know, 68,000 instructors around the world that have chosen to, uh, you know, use our, platform, you know, the creator platform, the creator marketplace that we've developed uh, to expose you know, their, you know, you know, great insight in the form of their teachings and, and the content to learners around the world. So, you know, we can take advantage of that on the Udemy business side and pull the best of the best in and uh, provide that to our business customers. So, you know, very unique, uh, you know, environment situation for us to, to have access to that amazing content that is, you know, the freshest content in the world because they're the instructors are monetarily incented to, you know, to, to make sure that it's the freshest and highest quality content. Indeed it is. And for our listeners, there is a fabulous report on Udemy's blog uh, called the Burson Report. Uh, I believe I am pronouncing his name right. Um, but that is, uh, yeah. that is something to dive into. Again, uh, whether you are the head of a corporate learning and development organization, or you are looking to upskill your own skills uh, for the organization that you Level currently up. serve. Um, thank you, Joe. Um, or As you looking, go along, Lisa, I'm just going to co compliment what you're saying. You're awesome. You're awesome. You, you're like my personal ego in a bag. Yikes! Um, <laughs> um, or you are somebody like me who is looking to uh, move industries after uh, a pretty long run at one great company. Um, so there is a lot that Udemy brings to the marketplace to fit anybody's needs, uh, consumer or corporate. Um, with that said, Greg, I have my own quiz question for you, and then I'll kick it back over to Ooh, this Joe. This is a surprise curveball. I didn't you're wasn't welcome. ready for this either. You know what? Because I haven't been on a podcast for a while, I had to. I had to sharpen my tools because I thought you were kind of kicking me to the curb. I got my coffee mug, and then I felt like it was. Mm -hmm, I felt like it was a parting gift, Joe. Okay, don't tell me a sob story. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, Greg. Uh, so, question for you: um, You have a crystal ball. How much longer does the Great Resignation last? Wow. Um, I think you're going to answer Not questions well, about. I'll give you, I'll give you a, <laughs> what's that, Joe? You're going to answer questions about inflation in the housing market in the middle of this too, right? Yeah, I was gonna, yeah. There you go. Um, you know, I will tell you, it is related uh, to you know everything that's going on in the you know, macroeconomic environment, and simply because you know, as you know, what we saw before the Great Resignation 
was, yeah, during COVID, no one was going anywhere because everybody's scared to death. And if they left the company, there wasn't going to be, you know, another job for them to go to. We all know that you know, those of us that have lived through recessions before, when you get into, like, really into the recession, which we're in it, but we're not in it in it right now. We're not seeing layoffs yet. And, yes, there's a few companies that come out and said they're not hiring, but you know, it's, it's not nearly uh, to the level of uh, – of impact that it's, that in my opinion, that it's, it's going to get to over the next six to 12 months. When that happens, you know, people are going to stop moving around. They're, they're going to stop taking time off, trust me, if, if in fact they need to work uh, because they're not going to necessarily, uh, you know, be confident that they're going to be able to find work somewhere else. So the, 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 so the short answer is I don't know, dependent on how deep and how long the recession goes, I would say, but uh, my hope would be another six to 12 months, uh, no longer than 12 months, but depending on how long the recession uh, and how deep the recession is, uh, I think we'll, we'll largely start to impact and will impact uh, the great resignation. That definitely makes sense. Yeah, we're, you know, it's, boy, what a phenomenon. I'll tell you what, uh, one, one phenomenon uh, is that we do like to ask our guests the same two questions to end the episodes here. We're going to ask them to you today. And we compile these answers, uh, and, and it's really interesting because it tells a story. Number one, what didn't we say about Udemy today? Something that you want to talk about, I don't know, a podcast maybe that you have or announcement you want to make here live on the EdUp Experience, you know, anything at all that we didn't say about Udemy that you'd like to, to talk about to our audience. And then secondarily to that, what do you see as the future of higher education or the future of learning? And take those in any way you'd like. Sure. I mean, I touched on, uh, you know, the, what makes Udemy special, what, what makes Udemy different, which is a question I get quite often. And it really is the amazing marketplace that our founders developed, you know, 13 years ago that really has, you know, manifested in our ability to bring the best of the best content in and provide that to organizations, large and small. We now have about 16,000 courses in our Udemy business uh, catalog. We've got 170,000 courses in total on the platform and and you know look 13 years ago that nobody could have possibly had the foresight that udemy business would would have you know been formed and then been doing what we're doing as far as outpacing the growth of the category right now I mean, we're a public company so i can talk about this i mean we're growing at 80 percent year over year right now at amazing a three, at, a, at a 300 million dollar uh you know level of, of revenue which is at scale and and, and the reason is it, it really just comes down to the quality uh, of the content and experience have, uh, folks have engaging with that content in the marketplace. So that's, that's really what makes it special. And the fact that we're mission driven, I mean, this is a group of folks. We're now 1,300 employees that get up every day, so darn proud and passionate about the ability to impact lives through learning uh, the way that we do, both in individuals as well as in, within organizations. And it fuels us. Uh, it, it really is what drives uh, the organization forward, and it's one of the reasons why uh, I was so excited and am sort. I was excited to join, and I'm so excited to be a part of uh, of this journey uh, with this amazing group of folks. So, yeah, you know, that's that's what I, I guess I would say to folks that uh, want to know a little bit more about us or what makes us special. Uh, what was the second question, Joe? What do you see as the future of higher education and or learning in general? Look, higher ed is going to evolve. I believe higher education, and we're already starting to see it, you know, based on the interest that we're seeing and uh, others are seeing and being a part of our journey, i.e., you know, Corp U, as I mentioned earlier, and we've already got relationships with higher education and, and instructors within higher ed. Uh, you know, that's going to continue to evolve. You know, organizations are asking for a, a bit more of a skills orientation, Higher ed is going to want to deliver that. Otherwise, you're going to at some point become a disconnect. And, you know, although higher ed typically moves much slower than corporate America in terms of their ability to evolve, they, higher ed definitely evolves. There's no question. And, uh, and I think that we're starting to see that, and we're going to see more of it. So I think there's going to be a more of an evolution towards a skills orientation. And, you know, we, you know, we're going to be a part of that with them. We're going to be partnering with them and a part of helping them navigate uh you know that that process that they're going to have to go through uh and to be able to you know maybe bridge some of the the gap that, that is currently there but uh you know we're definitely seeing seeing a willingness and a desire for higher ed to to really understand what corporate america and, and global uh, corporations need and then for them to be able to, to serve those needs um 
Go ahead, Joe. You're gonna say something. No, I love what you're saying. Keep going. And then, you know, as far as you know, the future of Ed. I mean, we talked about. At least I love your example, uh, your personal example, just in terms of skills acquisition. It's that growth mindset, I, and we talk about it with our kids. We talk about it with our companies, with our employees. I mean, it's. I think the best organizations foster that growth mindset, and the way to grow and develop uh, is, you know, with very much a hybrid approach, hybrid from the standpoint that higher ed has a place, but then, you know, if you need to acquire a specific set of skills or capabilities, you've got platforms like Udemy and others. Uh, and, you know, you've got organizations that, uh, you know, companies that we partner with that care a lot about giving their learners optionality and different modalities. Podcasts for one, you know, Joe, we were talking about before we got on here, I, I run a podcast internally and, you know, that's a modality we're considering for our platform. Right, uh, yeah, for our instructors to potentially use, and so you know, there's different you know uh, ways by which that we can enable you know our organizations, our customers, uh, to deliver learning and and capability to their to their employees uh, that is going to continue to help them grow and evolve, and 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 obviously you know we're incented to do that. So you know, we're excited about the future. I mean, look, I don't think there's ever been a better time to be in you know just ed tech in general, higher ed education technology because of the evolution and the, the digitization that's happening, we talked about earlier, uh, but also, but more importantly, I would say on a global basis, the desire and appetite we're seeing from with organizations to evolve and change and to bring in platforms like Udemy and others to help them develop the next generation of, you know, you know, kind of what learning is going to look like within their organizations. And it's not going to be, you know, what it used to be, which is everybody flying instructors on site to do it face to face and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, we couldn't be more excited about, uh, you know, that journey uh, with our customers and being a part of it. What I love about what you said, and as we end the episode, we talk about all the time with people in higher education, those that run universities and so on, is that we have to be listening to business and industry. And business and industry is saying we are moving really fast to keep in, to hire and keep people. And not, you know, our mission here at the Edup Experience is to foster and, and to communicate lifelong learning no matter the path somebody chooses. And everybody chooses it differently. It's It can't be the same. It can't be prescribed. Everybody needs to learn in a different way, which is why you're seeing organizations like Udemy grow at X percent year over year because of that demand, because you're servicing a working learner the way they need to be serviced, which is one of the ways higher education has really failed over the years is we, we haven't moved fast enough as fast as business and industry. And that's what, what I think the message is to, to the listeners today is the, the business and industry is moving really fast and higher ed needs to move as fast and in learning organizations need to move as fast as technology companies. That's what I like to say. Our technology company is really the way and setting the pace. Greg, you're setting the pace, my friend out there. Um, you're, um, a breaking new grounds, charting new path through higher education and, and education in general and how people learn. Um, but before I outro you, I have to give a little bit of credit here to my guest co-host today. Um, I asked, I said, Lisa, it, could you co-host co with me the rest of the week? Well, now she selected you, Greg. She said, I, I want to I do Greg. I want to come in. I want to talk to Greg. And I said, could you do any others? And, and she said, I have none to give. So she's got nothing left in the tank. She's not sabbatical, right, Lisa? That's exactly right. Your willing participant always with my shenanigans. Of course, she is Lisa Honecker. You heard her before. You'll hear her again, ladies and gentlemen. Lisa, it's always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Joe. And of course, our guest today, you heard him, you follow him, you know what's going on. He's the president of you to me. His name is Greg Brown. Oh, 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 yeah. And that is his official outro. Greg, it's been an absolute honor and pleasure to have you on. Hey, Joe, Lisa, really you know, appreciate the opportunity. It's been a ton of fun and I uh, wish you guys all the best. Hope to get back on here sometime soon. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you've just ed up. Employers use Unmodel to source talent directly from community colleges with a click of a button to commission needed training to develop existing talent. Highly qualified and diverse talent is absolutely necessary to grow in today's workforce. Try your free subscription today at unmodel.com slash employers.